Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be talking about Periphera, which is a phyla of the animal kingdom. And specifically, uh, we know them as sponges. And so to get into things, um, we know that sponges or Periphera are a monophyletic group, meaning that they share a most recent common ancestor, which is commonly abbreviated MRCA. And the way we know this is from our RNA and DNA evidence. And so um, by sequencing the genomes of sponge cells, by looking at the nucleus and uh, looking at the DNA itself, um, as well as the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA that makes up the ribosomes of these uh, sponge cells, um, we see uh, enough commonalities that we can justifiably say that they must share a most recent common ancestor. And despite being in the animal kingdom, which as we know humans are a part of, Health, um, sponges have very few derived traits, meaning although they're multicellular, heterotrophic, they don't have cell walls and they sexually reproduce, um, they have very few other things that like we would expect in humans, such as um, seeing cell specialization, we see tissues and organs and organ systems like the musculoskeletal system. Sponges don't have that. And so, um, and then also a key point to note is that sponges do have asexual means of reproduction. Um, if a large enough piece of a sponge is broken off and that fragment has the correct cell types, we know that the uh, sponge can regenerate back into uh, a fully functional um, unit or, or uh, organism. And um, also sponges are sessile, and this is a fancy way of saying that they don't move. Um, so they're fixed in place. Um, and so this kind of leads me to ask at least, <laughs> how do sponges eat if they don't move? And the way they do this is very interesting, especially uh, from my background as a chemical engineer, I'm fascinated by the design of things. and. I love looking at nature and seeing how nature, if we were to look at a sponge and ask ourselves, why is it shaped like that? There's a very good reason. And so sponges have something called an osculum. And an osculum is this central cavity that um, water is pulled up through. But it's very interesting to ask yourself, well, how is water being actively pulled through this osculum if these sponges don't have musculoskeletal systems? They're not able to you know, pump the water through them. So how are they doing this? And uh, as a chemical engineer, we know about Bernoulli's principle and Bernoulli's principle tells us that if we have a flowing fluid, there must be a pressure difference. There has to be an area of high pressure and the fluid will flow from the area of high pressure to lower pressure. And if you take organic chemistry labs, you'll also know that in some of the recrystallization experiments, what people will do is they'll turn on the faucet and the flowing stream of water uh, generates an adjacent vacuum. And if you hook this vacuum, as seen in this picture, up to your flask, you can create suction and help pull your solvent through and get your crystals to be dried out. Um, and so sponges use this exact same principle. The flowing water above them uh, generates a vacuum above the sponge and so the water is pulled from the area of high pressure beneath the sponge up through the osculum through the top and the reason that um, sponges need to do this is to get bacteria to actually eat and so this is for me a very interesting part about sponges because life and biology we know it takes very gradual steps and there has to be a force involved to actually make these kinds of transitions and so um, what i really like about sponges is the fact that we're seeing how it's beneficial for a unicellular microbe to join with other unicellular microbes on a scale such that they form these kinds of three-dimensional structures that we can see to the right here in which they're able to survive and they're better together as a part of it. So there's this push, this evolutionary advantage that sponges get for coming together. And so when sponges form these structures and are able to induce the Bernoulli effect, 
they're able to get access to the nutrients that they need. Um, and otherwise, they wouldn't be able to get those nutrients and they would die. So we are seeing the dependence and the early hints that uh, cell specialization might be important, um, which we do see in the other phyla of the animal kingdom. And so what uh, sponges do have, because there must be some kind of mechanism to hold them in place, because there's a bunch of cells, is something referred to as spongin. And spongin is a collagen protein, and collagen is a very ubiquitous protein found throughout the animal kingdom. And collagen is uh, formed by cells um, doing extracellular secretions of spongin. So the ribosomes would secrete the necessary proteins. These proteins would go to excretory vesicles, and those excretory vesicles would fuse with the phospholipid bilayer and finally deposit the sponge in, in an orderly fashion outside the cells to actually form these kinds of structures. And this is one of the funny things um, if you watched SpongeBob SquarePants growing up. Uh, so the thing with sponges is that they do have predators and the way they defend themselves is through um, secreting, in addition to collagen, or uh, specifically the spongin, they also secrete toxins. And these toxins make the sponges taste very bad to fish and uh, also echinoderms. And so uh, in, if you were in a marine environment, you would find that one of the biggest predators of sponges are echinoderms, which is starfish. And so that's pretty funny if you know SpongeBob, because SpongeBob's best friend is Patrick, who is a starfish. So that's pretty interesting and I thought it was a good way to uh, end things. So I hope you guys learned a thing or two. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.